Now, I thought it'd be good to have you on this show because I know you were at the Edinburgh Fringe, um, which is finished now. It ran through all of August and there was there's always one or two wee controversies erupt at the Edinburgh Fringe, but one of them this year was involving some comedy talent that had grouped together, um, led by an Irish uh, screenwriter and comedian called Graham Linehan. And they had uh, booked uh, the venue to have their show, but it was cancelled, and it was cancelled because Graham Linehan is quite outspoken against um, much of the um, the kind of gender trans thing that's going on at the moment, particularly opposing the um, uh, medical interventions on children and the issues regarding uh, women's rights and so on. And whatever one may think of that, what was particularly interesting was the fact that he couldn't actually get even a, a venue. Do you want to take up the story from the beginning on that and tell us your tell us your thoughts on on that matter? Yes, yeah. So I, I got a ticket because I was quite keen to see some of some of these uh, performers. Um, one of them was Dominic Frisby, uh, who we've featured some of his work on the UK column before, because some of the songs he does he does humorous songs and some of those are quite on point. Uh, so I thought, well, this is a chance to actually meet him. You know, we've, we've talked about him on the call. It's a chance to meet him, say hello. Uh, so I got myself a ticket. And then uh, I got an email to say, oh, very sorry, it, uh, the venue has, has cancelled it. And there was, a, there was a very intemperate uh, announcement from the venue, which was the, uh, the arches in, in Leith. Um, very grumpy, very condescending, you know, these, these and, and it was it used the word cancelled. It was quite clear that it was cancelled culture. They used the word, and uh, so they said, "Well, look, um, we'll we'll get another venue if we possibly can, and we'll email you at half past three. We'll not announce where the venue is. We'll just email the ticket holders at half past three and tell them where the secret venue is." Now, this is something that has that is actually coming in more and more. If you want to see something that's controversial, so if it's regarding gender, if it's regarding race, um, these sort of areas, uh, the areas that have been made a cultural war by the Marxist left pushing. So if you want to see anything that's critical of the left wing establishment's views, uh, you're very likely to be cancelled. And this idea of having a secret venue, sometimes actually telling people where, we're go where they're going to meet and then meeting outside and then marching them to the venue so that people can't find out where the venue is at all until the show actually starts. These, these are the sort of nonsensical uh, things that have to be done in order to actually have free speech in this country. Uh, so they got a second venue and the second venue also cancelled when the pressure came on. Don't actually know where the second venue was, but they cancelled too. Mm -hmm. So they decided they would hold uh, the the, the um, comedy performance in the open air outside Holyrood. Holyrood's a good place for comedy. It's quite appropriate. Uh, so we had the, the, the joy of seeing Dominic Frisbee singing his song, Maybe, which has a verse about Nicola Sturgeon uh, right outside uh, Holyrood. So that was quite glorious. And, um, and, and uh, Graham Lenehan, you know, did, did his stand-up routine. Now, he's not a stand-up comedian. I think this was his about his, the sixth time he'd ever done stand-up. Now, I, I, I talk a lot publicly. The idea of doing stand-up, dear, I mean, that's that uh, has to be one of the hardest things to do. Uh, and it's not what he does for a living, but he's living, which is writing comedy. He's not able to carry that on because he's been totally cancelled because mm. of his views on... Um, on the transgender issue. Views which 10 years ago would have been shared by 100% of the population, basically. Um, so he, he, can't, he, he can't carry on his business, he can't carry on his, 
is essentially his first love in terms of his career. So he's doing a bit of a bit of stand up and, and telling a few jokes, he says, to keep his hand in. And they wouldn't even let him do that. Now, there were about 150 people turned up. Uh, it was a very warm crowd. They were very glad to see all the all the people performing. And uh, we all went around the pub afterwards and had a good chat. So it was a nice night. Um, and um, But it's it's very sad that it came to that, that in Edinburgh City, with the Enlightenment and all that, you can't actually get a venue, tell a few jokes, um, without somebody cancelling you, not for even what you're going to say, you know, it's what, what you're deemed to have said or you're deemed to believe. It's, it's thought, That's, that was his, that was his, his thing. It's thought, he believed the wrong thing. Yes, yes, that's, that's uh, remarkable as well, considering how many venues there are in, in, um, in Edinburgh during the Fringe, there's literally um, thousands of performers and hundreds of shows and consequently hundreds of venues as well. Um, but not to be able to find one is really quite quite telling and unfortunate. And I yeah. often think it would be great if we had some sort of our side, had some kind of benefactor who had, you know, a large pub or a building that's got a stage in it or a, a, a hall or something like that who who um, is always on call to be able to host um, controversial, potentially controversial um, acts or meetings or things like that. And there are such people who do own buildings in the centre of Edinburgh and so on, that's, it would be good if some of them stepped up and said, you can use my ballroom or you can use this or that or whatever and weren't so uh, worried about attacks. Because at the end of the day, you know, all this ducking and diving and so on is is uh, is ridiculous. And nobody should really be afraid of of uh of standing up and giving their point of view on those things so it's a sorry a sorry state of affairs do you think it's becoming worse in scotland or do you think that's maybe always been a bit like this i mean certainly in the past and i'm talking about going way back in the past you know it was very dangerous if you had the wrong opinion on things you could find yourself that you know at the wrong end of a of a gallows so maybe we've moved on in that sense but we still haven't reached perfection and we're a long way from perfection i think it's getting worse mm -hmm. presently I'll give you a couple of examples uh the scottish union for education which is doing excellent work pushing against the indoctrination of children so they don't want uh they don't want the um the the, the sex education that, that amounts to grooming they don't want the queer theory being rolled out in schools. They don't want the critical race theory um, indoctrinating the children that everything that they are, the, the very colour of their skin is somehow is somehow toxic and that everything that Britain is or did is all reprehensible. Um, they're pushing back against that and they're wanting actual education, want education, not indoctrination. So they got, they got deplatformed um, several times. Right, so they're getting deplatformed. Um, they ended up in one in one point uh, in a church. A church hall took them in uh, and said, "So this is the Tron Church in Glasgow." Took them in for one event where they've been deplatformed by, a, uh, I think it was, like, it was either a council-run or a co-op-run um, organisation in Glasgow. Uh, but it's not every sort of event that a church would consider appropriate, and this is quite a you know, brave church because the churches aren't doing much in, in the way of bravery at the moment, unfortunately. Um, there are a few exceptions. And uh, so that's that's one example. Um, I've been deplatformed a few times. Um, and I learned one thing that uh, if you hire a hall from uh, a member of the Muslim faith, they don't deplatform you. They don't they don't bow to pressure. They actually, if you make a deal, they'll, they'll honour the deal. Um, 
that's an interesting data point. And uh, one of the big events that uh, Mike Robinson was at down, down in England a couple of years ago that got cancelled and they ended up in the Islamic Hall as well. So it's, it, the, the Islamic community seems more immune to the pressure. And the, inter the interesting thing about the pressure is a consistent thing. When, when this happens and you're deplatformed, and I've been deplatformed a few times and, and had a bit of trouble over the, over the years, um, when you're deplatformed, they never tell you why right they, they never they never come and say look someone's phoned up and they've said this about you right you're an anti-semite holocaust denier you're an anti a homophobic bigot you're whatever right they never they never say this is this is the accusation is it true would you like to answer it there's never a point where you're given the opportunity to defend yourself ever they're just cancelled right? and i don't actually get this why you, you, you've, you've hired a hall to somebody, someone else who you've no, no dealings with, you don't know them, phones up and says, this person that, that uh, you've hired a hall to, he's very bad. And uh, you must, you must, you must deplatform him, you must cancel his, cancel his booking. Why do they do it? Why, why do they say, look, who are you? Why are you telling me what to do? Have you got any evidence? <coughs> Would you like to put the evidence in writing that this person is going to be doing something which is unlawful? No, they don't do anything like that. They fold. And it's this, it's this kind of cravenness about it. Oh, someone might criticize me. Oh, I'm going to fold. Oh, it's so pathetic. And it's, this, is, this is part of the thing that's, that's, that's wrong with our society. We should be less pathetic. Speak the truth, right? Speak what you believe. And then if someone comes back with, a different viewpoint. Listen, think about it, answer them. Don't go all, you know, peril clutching and wounded. Yes, I, and speak. I think uh, sometimes what it also uh, depends upon as well is simply the kind of person that you're dealing with. You know, if you're dealing with, for example, you, you spoke there about the, the mosques uh, being perhaps more open. I mean, you're dealing with sort of middle aged, older men basically uh who who are quite strong-minded on various things if you're dealing with some kind of wee pub in edinburgh it's probably going to be students maybe you know they haven't even finished university yet maybe they're a wee bit timid about life that kind of thing and so they're going to be less um serious really on those matters and perhaps more inclined to 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 flee or to be intimidated, or something like that. Um, if you're dealing with like a working men's pub in Bradford or something like that, they're not going to be intimidated by anybody. Well, so it, it depends it, the, the culture it, of the actual establishment itself. Yeah, yeah it, it was interesting to note that the film, uh, the film about what it is to be a woman, right? It was, it, was it what is a woman? Was that, was that uh, one called? something was like a, that? Another the, one. <laughs> there was a film that was cancelled twice in in Edinburgh at the university because we can't show things at the university because reasons. And the university security were very instrumental in getting it cancelled. Right? They were, they were the, the merest hint of any, of any argument and they just basically closed the whole thing down. This happened twice. They moved it to a, a, a pub in working class Colt Bridge and you know none of the student, student protesters went there. Mm. They, just, they just they were absent. Or whether mm. they just couldn't be bothered going to Coat Bridge, whether they didn't know where Coat Bridge was, <laughs> um, or um, or whether the idea of trying to go to a working class pub and cause trouble didn't seem as quite as quite as attractive as 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 their university, which is very woke and is already kind of basically on their side. I don't know. But, I, yeah, I think you, you've got a point. Yes, I think a lot of that has to do has to do with those with the with the actual the culture um, and the and the the place that it's happening as well, and that's big cities as well are different from rural areas. Um, in big cities, you get those fashionable types. In rural areas, traditionally, it's been less fashionable um, politically and in other ways. So. And that's that's also has to be factored in. Now, before we go on, I just want to ask the viewers 
our question, which is for these Union Jack playing cards. And send your answers, folks, to contact at aforceforgood.uk. And if you've never done it before, all you need to do is send your answer to there. And you're in with a good chance of winning. The question is, on this day, 1952, a plane flew for the first time. What was its name? A very famous RAF plane. Give us the name and these Union Jack playing cards could be in the post to you tomorrow. Contact at a force for good dot uk. Good, good. Good, good. Yeah. Well, on the subject of speech being cancelled, in fact, speech being dangerous, um, Police Scotland have have gone into swift action today. And uh, you might be thinking, is it to is it to address some of the um, blatant uh, corruption inside the Scottish government? No. no. Uh, how, how about corruption inside local authorities? No, it's not that. How about corruption inside Police Scotland? No, it's not that either. No, it's the it's the man in the street who called Patrick Harvey a deviant. He's been arrested. Oh my. Right. Now he's been arrested on, I still don't know what charge yet. Um, so the police have said, uh, mm. he's, been, he's been char arrested and charged over homophobic com um, comments. So the police have concluded that Colin Patrick Harvey, a deviant, deviant, relates to his homosexuality. That's the, that's the decision that the police have made. Um, now, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the point I was making on the column on Monday was Patrick Harvey himself identifies as queer. He uses the word queer to represent what he terms as us, our people. Right. So the, the group he's coming from use the term queer to identify themselves. Queer is a synonym of deviant. So presumably... If the man had said, you're queer, Mr. Harvey, Mr. Harvey would have said, yes, I am. And I'm, and I'm very proud to identify with that label, I guess. Yes. All right. So what he did, he chose the wrong synonym. Mm -hmm. And he's mm -hmm. been arrested by Police Scotland. So Police Scotland are now policing synonyms. You choose the wrong one. You end up with a criminal record. Presumably, they haven't got their hate crime nonsense, I think, in place yet. But presumably, they'll they'll do something. It'll it'll be before a single judge, and the judge will decide the context, and the judge will decide what the man meant, and there won't be any justice, and there certainly won't be a jury, and he'll get some sort of conviction, which could have very significant effects on his life. Well, his absolutely, employment, employment absolutely. Ability. Any any conviction, especially for these um, these modern fashionable hate crimes, um, can always be spun very badly. Unfortunately, yeah. against you for something that uh, very 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 recently wouldn't have even really raised an eyebrow. And as well, you mentioned that particular word, deviant. It uh, doesn't necessarily refer even to sexuality if, if you're referring to other deviant practices many people would uh, quite rightly say that if you think children should get medical interventions to try to change their their bodies that, that's a, a horrifically deviant policy that people like Patrick Harvey support um, and deviant and, meaning and, just and, simply wrong in yeah. that regard. De and, yeah, and also the, the whole introduction of queer theory into schools. Right? If, you, if you dig into the origins of queer theory, the original paper on queer theory uh, was written by an American academic called Gail Rubin. And uh, that was openly um, promoting um, paedophilia. The yes. half of it was to do with paedophilia. So... That that was the, that was the that was the that was ground zero of queer theory. The main um, the main proponents, the main gurus of queer theory, people like Michel Foucault, were e extremely dangerous and predatory uh, with uh, with small boys, and went to North Africa amongst other places um, to have uh, uh, oh sex with boys. So this is this is where queer the queer theory came from, and if you look at what it's trying to do, it's trying to it's trying to essentially 
dissolve the family system, um, dissolve the the binary between men and women, um, and and make everything fluid. So it's, a, it's an assault on society. That is by definition deviant, right? Because it's not the norm. In fact, it's trying to destroy the norm. So there are many reasons, other than his personal um, sexuality, for suggesting to Mr. Ha Mr. Harvey that his policies, his beliefs, could legitimately be called deviant. Um, but Mr. Harvey didn't try and defend that position. He didn't say to a man, why are you calling me that? He just called him a bigot uh, because that apparently wins the argument. And then uh, reported to the police so that they could go and intimidate uh, uh, an ordinary member of the public for being rude to a politician. Uh, yes. Because that's the sort of politics we have these days. Yes. Politics where don't annoy the right, don't annoy the wrong people because we'll be tied to you if you do. And this is, of course, the system where people are afraid of the politicians, which is the system of fascism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also in Scotland, we have to remember that just prior to the 2014 referendum, Alex Salmon centralised the police and essentially made it so that, although it's maybe not f formally recognised, it's nevertheless kind of um, understood that the First Minister is essentially in charge of the police. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a hierarchical structure with the, basically the Scottish Cabinet at the top of it. Whereas in past times, it was very much diffused throughout the various regions or however it was organised in the past. Um, but by the centralisation of it, which Salmon did deliberately because he thought, well, what happens if we win this? I want to be making sure I've got the whip hand over the police just because there could be all sorts of unexpected consequences as far as a civil peace is concerned. So he centralised it all prior to the 2014 referendum as deliberate strategy to ensure that he and his mates were essentially in charge of the police. So Patrick Harvey is a cabinet m member. Uh, he's part of the so-called Scottish government. And so the police themselves have to be aware of that and have to realise that basically Patrick Harvey is one of their bosses uh, at the end of the day. How ridiculous does that sound? But that's actually true. I mean, he's part of the Scottish government that runs Police Scotland. So whatever he wants, he's going to get, or at least the police are going to be sucking up to him, to use an unfortunate turn of phrase. The, 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 just to illustrate the point here, right? So the, if, you talk to, if you talk to the Scottish government, particularly Scottish government officials, they are terrified of the chance that they're influencing the police, right? And they will use the independence of the police as an excuse for inaction, where they really should be acting to actually try and highlight or, or, or address some injustice. We'll go, oh, no, 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 it's the police are independent, can't touch them. So they're very, to, almost to a, to a fault, keen to show how independent the police are. But the question is, are they really? Uh, we've got Shawnee Boy, the, the, the satirist, uh, when he does these impersonations of Patrick Harvey, one of the things he has Patrick Harvey say is, I own Police Scotland. You can't touch me, I own Police Scotland. All right, it's yeah. He said, yeah, it's interesting that a satirist should say that. And mm. to give you a couple of uh, very specific points, we have, of course, had the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Livingston, Ian Livingston, um, say how difficult the investigation into the £666,000 worth of missing money in the SNP has been because of his close relationship with Nicola Sturgeon, former First Minister. Well, that's an interesting data point. And an even more important one, and I encourage people to go and look this up, um, the overseeing body, because when, when the, all the police forces were amalgamated into one, that was clearly a too much power in one place problem, so we've got an overseeing body called, called the Scottish Police Authority. Now, this was formally headed by Susan Deacon after a whole series of just disastrous um, uh, heads of the SPA. It was just one horrendous mess after another. They got Susan Deacon, who tried to sort the mess out. And she eventually said it's, it's, not, it's not fixable and resigned. And in her resignation letter, she talked about the problem being politicisation of the police. So it's in black and white from a person at the very head of the Scottish Police Authority. You know, this is a problem. Yes, yes, exactly. 
exactly. Yeah. No, it's it's um, people in Scotland can't press charges, can they? It's they have to rely upon. It's the police who make the decision. That's my understanding. Well, you can't it's, say, it, it's the Crown Office. Yeah, this is yeah. very so. It's very centralised. So, so yeah. in England, you can bring a private prosecution, private criminal prosecution. In Scotland, you can't unless you get specific permission. Specific permission has not been granted ever in the last 120 years. Right. Okay, so you're not getting permission. You can ask, but the answer is no. Now, all prosecution in Scotland is by the Crown Office and Procurator, Procurator Fiscal Service. So the police report to them. They decide who gets prosecuted. Now, this puts a huge amount of of power in the hands of the Lord Advocate, who is, of course, a member of the Cabinet, uh, Hamza Yusuf's Cabinet. So there's not a great deal of separation of powers there. And is also an advisor, legal advisor to the Scottish Government. So there's not a lot of separation of powers there either. So um, to give you a couple of examples of how total that is, all decisions on having fatal accident inquiries in Scotland are, are carried out by uh, the Crown Office uh, headed by the Lord Advocate. So if somebody ends up dead under suspicious circumstances, this same organisation decides whether there'll be an investigation or not. That's not good. Um, and um, to give you an ex another example of how total the, the control is, there was a case where uh, there was a tax case and the, 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 the HMRC in London sent up one of their hotshot lawyers to prosecute the tax case. And he went up to the, he came into the Scottish court and he said to the judge, in his plummy English voice, he said, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and I'll be prosecuting this case. And the judge says, no, you won't. He says, excuse me, I will. I'm from HMRC. Uh, and the judge says, no, you're not. You're from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs in Scotland. You have no prosecutorial powers. You are a witness in this case. It's only the Crown Office that can prosecute. Everything. <laughs> TV licensed a lot. Now, this concentrates all the power in the hands of the Lord Advocate. A very key post, and if the Lord Advocate is, shall we say, open to persuasion or bent or compromised or involved in some sort of abuse or covering up abuse or anything like that, then anyone who crosses the police, any part of the justice system in Scotland is in serious trouble because there's only one place to go, and that's the Crown Office. And the Crown Office is totally opaque. The 40, to give you another example, 40%, roughly 40% of the cases where the police do an investigation, they, they're satisfied as a crime and they've got enough, in, they've got enough uh, evidence to proceed. They put it to the Crown Office, whose lawyers assess whether the evidence is strong enough. And they said, yes, there's enough here to proceed. There's a crime being committed and there's enough to get a, a reasonable chance of a conviction. 40% of those don't go ahead. So if it's a case of friends being being protected, you just lose the odd case in the 40% that don't go ahead. And everything's okay and people don't get people don't get prosecuted. This is the core of the magic circle scandal in um, in, in, in the Edinburgh legal circle. This mm -hmm. is a lot of things because we we're a small country. And it's based on having a few people who are meant to be fine, upstanding Christian gentlemen who don't do anything wrong, and they're put in key positions. And we don't have checks and balances. And if those key positions are occupied by people who are corrupt or open to undue influence or simply weak and doing whatever is easy, mm -hmm. then everybody in the entire country suffers very profoundly because if, you're, if your criminal justice system is corrupt, then essentially your whole country has a big rotten sore at the heart of it. Yes, yes, very good point and well explained. Thank you for taking that time to explain that because I had been wondering about that just prior to coming on the show, just what, uh, who, who, who decides as it were. David, we're at the top of the hour. I just want to remind people that you are, uh, can be found your UK column can be found at twitter.com forward slash UK column. And UK column itself is at ukcolumn.org. And your Twitter is at twitter.com forward slash Albion underscore Rover. Thank you very much, David, for 
all your thoughts tonight and for coming in and enlightening us with with your point of view we will have you back on again uh, shortly no doubt because you're you're one of our favorite guests so unless you've any parting words oh just just i thank you for having me on it's been it's always a real pleasure to come on and, and talk with you uh, i was hoping we might get on to some of the things that you've experienced um, by way of pressure and the people attending attempting to silence you maybe Maybe we can talk about that next time, or maybe I'll have you on on, on UK column and we can talk about it there. But uh, for for tonight, right. thank you very much. It's been it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you, David, and uh, have a lovely evening. S speak again. Bye now. Thank you.